I think the first time actually I uh, I met Danger Ranger was just randomly out on the playa in 1996, and um, and then slightly less randomly um, when back when there was rave camp and camp, and we were camped somewhere in between, and uh, somebody got hit in their tents, and then I remember going over there, and you were out that way, and it was a pretty intense moment. But I kind of had met him in weird, intense moments of flamethrowers and things like that through the years. And it wasn't until just uh, a few months ago um, when I saw him give a version of this talk uh, for a kind of future of Burning Man planning session. And uh, I was blown away by both how objective he was uh, and uh, for n since I knew he was kind of in the middle of all these things, he's become an amazing historian that is able to get a kind of a, a thousand foot view on it um, at the same time of being intimately connected to it. Uh, so I really hope you enjoy tonight. The, um, the note is also that this is a longer talk than normal. Um, we'll probably won't have too much time for questions, but uh, we'll be hanging out. You'll be hanging out this evening for uh, more discussion. And I think um, there's actually a lot of people in this room that have a lot of great backstory on the uh, on the things that uh, will be talked about. So I think um, we can kind of distribute that uh, need as it goes on. So, welcome. Thank you, Michael. Michael. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, the five ages of Burning Man. Hello and welcome to the interval. I want to thank the Long Now Foundation for asking me to speak here. Tonight, I'm going to talk about the structural history of Burning Man. So prepare yourself for 30 years crammed into 60 minutes. For those of you who don't know me, let me briefly tell you about myself. In the 1960s, the Navy sent me from Texas to San Francisco. Afterwards, I went to work in Silicon Valley as an engineer during the early days of the personal computer. I worked for Fairchild Semiconductor during the 1970s. I once passed up an offer to be involved with a new company called Intel. I never regretted that decision. In the early 1980s, I managed the installation of Apple Computer's first robotic assembly line. After that, I helped start one of the first technology companies to be located in San Francisco. Maybe I should apologize for that. <laughs> now I'm a social engineer and historian. I've attended Burning Man 29 times, and they call me Danger Ranger. This is a story, I'm going to tell you about the five ages of Burning Man. This is a story of a cultural movement, the evolution of an organization, and the discovery of civic design. This is also my story. Your mileage may vary. First, you need to know a little bit about what happened before Burning Man came into being. Its roots lie in the 1960s and 70s Bohemian culture of San Francisco. In San Francisco in the 1980s, I was a member of a kind of social club called the Cacophony Society. Each month, various members got together and did events which were often odd, unusual, and challenging. Cacophony drew from eccentric European traditions that preceded us, like the Dadaist, the Surrealist, and the Situationist. Other local influences were San Francisco culture jammers like the Beats, the Merry Pranksters, the Diggers, and an underground cacophony precursor called the Suicide Club. We had an open membership and made sure we were not underground. Our motto was a randomly gathered network of free spirits united in the pursuit of experiences beyond the pale of mainstream society. You may already be a member. <laughs> Cacophony developed numerous traditions that made its events remarkable. Everyone was included. You had permission to be or try anything. Events needed to be free. You took responsibility for your actions. You left places cleaner than when you found them. We used fake names. And long before smartphones, it was be here now. Duocracy, if you have a great idea, you do it. Everyone was a participant. There were no spectators. Political and religious propaganda was unwelcome, which goes back to including everyone. These are some of the things that Cacophony later gave to Burning Man. 
And so we enter the first age, the age of exploration. Let's see how it unfolded. 1986, a guy named Larry Harvey called his friend Jerry James and said, hey, let's build a man and burn him on the beach. Larry Harvey and Jerry James, best friends, Larry a dreamer and Jerry a carpenter, build an eight-foot-high wooden figure resembling a man and burn it on the beach for the summer solstice. It's little more than a family picnic. Larry and Jerry each brought their young boys, their ex-wives, and their roommates. <laughs> and the boys fashioned a wooden dog to accompany the man. Not sure how to make a fire, they douse the figure with gasoline and light it, <laughs> which goes up like a second sun. Strangers come running from everywhere down the beach, which creates a party around it. Larry, excited by the response, decides to do it again the next year, but bigger, of course. And so they did. The second time, they made more of an effort to invite people with this flyer. Jerry James, the carpenter, helped Larry build a man that was a little taller, about 15 feet. It was a small affair, maybe 20 or 30 people, but they had a tradition on their hands. Then, in 1988, I heard about some people who were going to burn a wooden man on Baker Beach on the solstice. I assumed they were pagans or something, but it sounded fun. So a friend and I went down to the beach, but there were no pagans. It was Larry Harvey and Jerry James collaborating on this very Dada anti-art project of creation and destruction. At 30 feet, their third man was twice as tall and more complex. The arms were made to pivot by pulling on a rope after he stood erect. It was all very interesting. After that, I kept in touch with them. Since I was a principal editor of the Cacophony Society newsletter, I decided I would list next year's event in a future issue of the newsletter, which was perpetually titled Rough Draft. <laughs> when the Cacophony Society saw the event listed in our June of 89 newsletter, the number of attendees quadrupled. Word of mouth became the printed page, and Cacophony came out in force and pitched in to help with logistics, communication, and construction. By now, the man had become 40 feet tall, the height it would remain for the next two decades. It took several pickup trucks to haul the parts to the beach. Participation is high in these first years, with lots of hands to sneak the parts down to the beach before the authorities could notice. By 1990, we were showing up on the beach with 350 people. But by then, many of these people were not friends or friends of friends. We had a four-story tall wooden man and more uninvested spectators. As darkness approached, we prepared to erect the man. But this time, the authorities arrived before we could strike a match. You can't do this here. Where's your permit? Here, Jerry James and Larry Harvey discussed the matter while as an apprehensive crew, mem crew member looks on. <laughs> After much negotiation, we convinced the authorities that we would erect the man but not burn it. The crowd, many of whom were drunk and had simply come for the spectacle, were not happy. Amid cries of, burn it anyway, Larry realized that the event was not the same anymore. It was too easy to show up and have an opinion. It was now attracting the wrong people. But even with an angry crowd, we kept our word. We had a party around the man, but we did not burn it on the beach that night. And it turned out okay, because we heard about a place far out in Nevada where we could burn a giant wooden man. We were just going to have to think outside the San Francisco box and leave the first age behind. So here are the factors we just looked at which made the first age what it was, a free experimental underground event with a low barrier to entry but with a high rate of participation by experienced cacophony veterans. Now we enter the age of rapid growth. Burning Man moves to the harsh Nevada desert and develops its full culture, and nearly flies out of control by the end of this age. Nevada is the only place where Burning Man could have taken root, grown, and matured. It's a place where anyone could gamble. In fact, we rolled the dice each year. In the beginning, we burned through our credit cards. We pressed on against all odds. 
Two months after the solstice event on the beach was shut down by the police, a new event was listed in rough draft. It was called Zone Trip Number Four, Bad Day at Black Rock. Cacophonist John Law and Kevin Evans had been planning an event in the Black Rock Desert, a place outside the reach of urban rules and regulations, and now we decided to bring Larry's homeless sculpture with us. The Black Rock Desert, two hours north of America, is a 400 square mile dry lake bed. The playa is a barren flat plain devoid of plants and animals. There are no rocks there. This is liminal space, a true tabula rasa or blank slate upon which you can make a big mark. We heard about marvelous things happening out on that tabula rasa, things like the Black Rock Invitational Golf Tournament, where the greens were beautifully painted with food coloring, and games of giant croquet using pickup trucks as mallets. <laughs> yes, the Black Rock Desert had a reputation as a place to make bold statements. And so we arrived Labor Day weekend in 1990. Suddenly, the barrier to entry is high. You had to expend some effort to be there. The distance from San Francisco and the difficulty of surviving in a harsh environment with attendance down to about 80 diehard people. Our little caravan pulled off the pavement at the edge of the Black Rock Desert, where I took a stick and I drew a line on the ground and I said, "On the other side of this line, everything will be different." Then we all stepped across that line together. We brought with us Larry's Burning Man, the cacophony principles of participation, costuming, absurdity, leaving no trace of ourselves, and the rest. Each of cacophony's principles became coded into Burning Man. Some of them became a written list of ten principles. Some left unwritten, still taught to new participants by an enculturation process. So we went to the desert, and we built a large wooden man there. We were way out on the playa. It was so vast, twisted by mirage, you couldn't see the camp until you were nearly upon it. We had much to learn about the desert. Our attempt at communal shade structure quickly collapsed as we discovered that parachutes were designed to catch the wind. <laughs> We spent much of that first day lying under our cars and trucks like lizards to escape the brutal sun. But evenings were wonderful. John Law, Chris Radcliffe, and myself owned a neon sign company called Central Services. In 1990, John began the tradition of neon installations with this ground-level artwork of white neon tubes. Here's John Law in 1990. He handled most of the logistics involved in this trip. We also began a tradition of holding a cocktail party before the burn, in formal wear, very cacophony. In those first years on playa, everyone pulled on a rope to raise the man. Dave Warren lit the man that year by breathing fire onto it. By the end of the three-day weekend, it was clear that we would be back again. We were already thinking of ways to make it better. Here's the next event listing in the July '91. Issue of Rough Draft. Some of the highlights were wind sailing, bread, bread baking, a bar and lounge, and the burn night cocktail party. We decided to cover costs of the man, transport, and porta potties with a $15 entrance fee. Concerned with the harsh realities of the desert, we published the first survival guide. In 1991, neon was placed directly on the man so it could be seen for long distances at night. During those early years in the open desert. It acted as a beacon, welcome home. And that year, I drove the first art car to Burning Man, <laughs> beginning a trend that has grown to epic proportions. 1992 saw the birth of many long-lasting cultural traditions. Larry Harvey once said that the marks of civilization are threefold: that when you woke up in the morning, you wanted a toilet, a cup of coffee, and a newspaper. The first two were already available. To answer the third need, I published the first on-site newspaper using a Mac 512K and a dot matrix printer. I quickly handed off the Gazette to Stuart Mangrum, who launched the Burning Man Communications Department. 1992 also saw the 
It was the first year that electronic music appeared on the playa. On Friday, Turbo Ted played to no one but a cloud of dust. <laughs> a couple of days later, Goa Gill played to a crowd of about 25. Also in 1992, I started the Black Rock Rangers, a volunteer group of people with radios who were charged with looking out for the welfare of other participants. Black Rock is a large, hostile desert where participants often got lost looking for camp. Getting lost out there is literally deadly. So I designed the group to em emulate the legendary Texas Rangers, the frontier protectors of a previous century. We drive out on search and rescue missions and bring lost people back to camp. There were only six of us that first year, but today the Rangers number more than 800. The beginning of serious sculpture on the playa is generally considered to be this piece by British artist Serena de la Haye. Also in 1992 is Greg Schlesinger's Flume and Jim McCormick's, McCormick's Compass, a large cross made out of white tiles laid out in the, onto the playa marking the cardinal directions. Finally, in 1992, we were forced to renew our acquaintance with government regulations. Back in 1990, we flew completely under the radar. No one knew we were out in the desert. 1992 was the first year we had to fill out a permit before the event. This is the campsite map that we provided to the Bureau of Land Management. Today, we have an entire staff working year-round to deal with our federal landlords. 1993 witnessed the birth of the theme camp. There had been camps prior to 93 that had themes, but these were primarily someone's domicile. They were not promoted as attractions for wandering participants to investigate. That innovation belongs to Lisa Archer and Peter Doty, who created Christmas Camp. Here, Lisa's in the back while Peter works the crowd out front. In fine cacophony tradition, they never broke character. All weekend long, they relentlessly played loud Christmas carols and forced eggnog and fruitcake on thirsty <laughs> desert dwellers. Also that year, we were treated to an insane exploding couple performance by Kimmerick and Heidi Smith. But there were some other fireworks looming on the horizon. That year, we experienced our first scrape with extreme black rock weather. About 20 minutes after the man fell, we were hit by an epic wall of dust, wind, lightning, followed by rain. It was terrifying for many and apocalyptic and oral legend. Here's John and Larry drying out. <laughs> At the end of 93, we were so broke, we couldn't afford postage for the 1999-94 event announcement. We thought we were finished. Without that mailer, there would be no ticket sales next year and no money to continue. Then a miracle occurred. During cleanup, someone found booklets of first-class stamps strewn along the railroad tracks, <laughs> hundreds of dollars worth. <laughs> that mysterious jackpot carried us on to the next burn. <laughs> True story. So Burning Man continued, and look at this. Notice that in 1993, it's still a pretty intimate affair. We've reached maybe 1,000 people, mostly friends and friends of friends. But see what's about to happen. It's a good thing we've already established a strong culture because this is going to test us to our limits. It's 1994, and look at that miraculous postage. Here's the mailer envelopes that I created, which carried the map and survival guide, and also acted as your admission ticket. We were now asking people to pay $30 to attend the event. But without any real gate to enforce that, it was pretty easy to avoid. And a lot of people came wandering in from the local areas to see what was going on. Who were all these weirdos with blue hair and tattoo? And what were they doing out on the playa, burning a giant? idol. They concluded we must be Satanist. But we began to see a way to win them over. A lot of cacophonists had a wide libertarian streak in them. That's why we took so well to Nevada. We'd always had a polite, well-armed camp, with many amusing shooting events occurring against the backdrop of the mountains. 
After a couple of years, we thought we could connect better with the locals if we invited them to go shooting with us. Drive-by shooting. So where are we headed? We're heading out to the drive-by shooting range. Huh? Where we're going to drive by things and shoot them. Excellent. As you might well expect. Seven Magnum. Blow your head clean off. We're on an area where there's absolutely nobody. And uh, been doing this for several years. So this is a totally safe thing. But don't try this at home. No, no don't try this at home. No, the neighbors won't like it. Everybody is after Barney. I mean, he is. Barney is the one that's going to get zapped. And it worked. It began our ever-increasing rapport with the locals. They still figured we were Satanists, but we were Satanists with guns, and they could understand that. <laughs> Another way, way that Larry devised to connect with the locals was to describe everything as a piece of work. You don't talk about the art or the meaning. You describe the way it's made in the process of building. Soon you'd have them helping to build stuff. And there was a lot of stuff to build. In 94, we started making these beautiful lantern spires. The year before, the lanterns had been placed on the ground to form a processional to the man. After these blew away in that epic dust storm, Larry designed these spires, which made immovable navigation markers. Steve Mobile was our first lamplighter. Eventually, we would need hundreds of lamplighters for hundreds of spires. Ripper the Shark arrived from Texas in 1994. For many years, there had been an annual art car parade in Houston, Texas. Following the lead of the 5.04 p.m., they were starting to show up at Burning Man. Before cell phones and broadband, our first direct communication to the outside world was this pixelated photo, beamed from a Yagi antenna on the playa to a small tower at Bruno's Motel in Gerlach, and then uploaded to the internet through a 56K modem over a phone line. Hello, world. The 1994 schedule of events. There's no time to rest now. By 1994, we had hit our stride. We now numbered 2,000 people. Looking out over the camp that year, it was magic. I knew we were onto something, something big. The world was coming. In 1995, I started calling the camp Black Rock City. At 4,000 people, we were now the most populous place in Pershing County. We were beginning to attract more unhelpful attention from the government, and I felt we were due the respect that any city would receive. Still struggling to break even, we now raise the admission price to $35 per person. Trying to look more serious, I made actual tickets for 95. See those official-looking anti-counterfeit features? They're all <laughs> fake. 1995, we budgeted $400 for our first center camp cafe run by Miss P. Siegel, our cacophony den mother. The parachute as shade was still a bad idea. Both the parachute <laughs> and the $400 proved inadequate. But the cafe went on to become the huge institution that it is today. Burning Man's first web presence on the well was advertised in the Black Rock Gazette. We offer Burning Man as a space station on the internet. The Black Rock Rangers continued to evolve. Working at the fire perimeter in 94, we had trouble managing the crowd, and I realized I was wearing a confrontational pirate flag on my chest. The Rangers needed an approach and an image that was less confrontational and more persuasive. 
So I got together with Bill Barker and Stuart Mangum, and we came up with a design that was like the man standing, with the community circled around it, like an embrace. It began to change the nature of rangering in subtle ways. Here's an historic moment. In 1995, the first trash fence was tested at Burning Man. Conceived by Larry Breed, 75 yards of orange netting was positioned downwind to catch the trash. This photo shows the first piece of trash that was caught by that fence. <laughs> A fence that would later encompass the entire city. The calm before the storm. New people, we love them. Our mission is to reach new people. But as word got out about this thing in the desert, the population of newcomers began to overwhelm our small staff. And the percentage of people who understood our caretaking culture became ever lower. People were beginning to behave like that mob on the beach in 1990. And we began to get the Reno effect. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> the distance barrier for attendees from Reno was much lower, but they didn't know our culture. And as news of the event started to spread through underground independent media, they began to arrive in larger numbers just to crash the party. Lack of a defensible perimeter made that easy. Many were surprisingly unfamiliar with their desert backyard <laughs> and often survivally challenged. But they weren't alone. The first blow in 96 was the death of one of our own staff, four days before the event. Michael Fury had been riding his motorcycle drunk across the playa, playing chicken with a slow-moving van. The resulting accident was gruesome. Few people outside the staff knew about it, but we, the organizers, were devastated. Didn't help that we had picked a theme that year for the event, and the theme, Dante's Inferno. Chaos was almost assured as people tried to outdo each other with fire, explosions, and diabolical fire-breathing machine art. Helco was a fictional company that wanted to take over Burning Man. This is their corporate headquarters, which was incinerated in a terrifying tower of flame before the man burned. As I was rangering that night, some, a couple of guys came up to me and asked if they could burn their car. I said, sure, if you clean up afterwards. We burned everything that year. Amidst all that chaos, we had moved Techno Ghetto, a.k.a. Rave Camp, a full mile north of Center Camp to separate the large sound area away from the general population. Now we had an attractive nuisance outside of town that required driving back and forth all night long. One night, someone ran over two tents, seriously injuring three people. Marred by these vehicle accidents, numerous injuries, and one death, it was a difficult year. Burning Man had become a city and would need to evolve in ways that would allow management like a city. Disagreement about the event between the event founders flared up. Was it time to discontinue this experiment? Perspective is a very personal point of view. The participants looking out on apparently effortless city see everything that looks easy. But the organizers, down on the ground, the reality was much harder. Intimately connected with radios, we organizers were effectively on the scene of every crisis, wreck, and emergency. While the feelings from the experience are very real, being too close to the center warps a person's overall perspective. I realized that the majority of the participants had had a great and wonderful time. I wanted to keep doing Burning Man for all of them. We just needed to adjust our course and find ways to address the problems. After the 96 event, John Law decided to stop doing Burning Man. After the 96 event, I decided that riding the edge of chaos would be the Rangers' new motto. We were still reeling from the trauma and difficulties of 96 when Wired Magazine put us on their cover and notified the world that Burning Man was the new American holiday. <laughs> we were hitting the big time. Wow, that was a big six years. Now let's look back at how that age felt. We started with a very high barrier to entry in a very hostile but beautiful environment. 
Initial enculturation was high within our group, but we had to educate and win over the locals. Lack of a defensible perimeter was mitigated for a while by extraordinarily cultural development like the birth of the Black Rock Rangers, the invention of theme camps, the arrival of art cars, fascination with costuming, growth of the music scene, the founding of a cafe and newspaper, the addition of fire dancing, and the beginning of serious art on the playa. In spite of all that progress, the shift from word of mouth to alt media brought us a huge jump in population and a near descent into chaos. How could we climb out? The third phase, phase, protectionism, is largely defined by Burning Man's struggle for survival. Establishing control of a city perimeter, managing cash flow, public relations, and organizational development. When we expand the population curve outwards, we see that the, the early years barely register. Due to the chaos of 1996, the BLM refused our permit to use the Black Rock Playa in 97. So we moved over the hill and onto pl private property in Wallapai Valley, a place called Fly Ranch. There was a small playa next to it where we could safely burn the man. In 97, we had a population of 10,000. Our volunteer construction team, the Department of Public Works, began with a crew of Midwestern circus roustabouts and bike rodeo kids. Dubbed DPW, it was organized and managed by future board member Will Roger. Will brought his friend Rod Garrett, a professional architect, as the city designer. His plan placed the city inside the edge of the Fly Ranch property next to the smaller BLM playa. With design and construction teams now closely linked, the city infrastructure developed rapidly. This is also the point at which Harley Dubois refined the community services and the theme camp placement departments, a process that she had started a couple of years before. The location in Wallapai Valley gave Black Rock City its first natural protective boundary. There were only three roads in. It was our first taste of the advantages of controlling access, and we learned a lot. Over the next four years, next few years, controlling access to the event was a major focus. We finally got free-range driving under control. And the Black Rock Rangers no longer needed to do search and rescue in the deep playa. <laughs> it allowed them to refocus on mediating skills and general participant welfare, which is still their focus today. The ticket looked more professional than ever and had an actual trackable serial number. That year, I implemented the idea of different ticket prices to help smooth out cash flow. Accordingly, we sold early bird tickets for 50 and tickets at the gate for 65. Our first Jack Rabbit Speaks email newsletter was sent out in 97 by Marion Goodell, our current CEO, who greatly expanded our communications department that year. Today, the JRS has hundreds of thousands of subscribers. A communication department was also needed to handle the influx of mainstream media. In 97, we were descended upon by CNN, ABC Nightline, NBC, Time, The Washington Post, a German television crew, and publications from England, France, Japan, and Brazil. That year, the first Burning Man book was published by Wired magazine. We were getting more organized, more communicative, and for a while, better at cash flow. Seemed like a great year. But being on private property, we had traded our federal landlords for county supervision. This was a mech's blessing. Their book of festival regulations required electric street lights, pay phones, and marked numbered parking spaces for all vehicles. <laughs> when the county enforcement officer arrived, he realized how ridiculous that was. One good thing that emerged from it was an improvement in our civic structure. Washoe County decided that we needed street signs so emergency services could find fires or injured people in the crowded campsites. Unfortunately, they also determined we must have their unneeded, unneeded fire service and we must pay them over $300,000 for having that service on standby. The county sent the sheriff to impound all of our receipts at the gate to make sure the bill was paid. We ended up 1997 with zero money to pay our bills and nothing to move forward with. 
In desperation, Larry got on a straw bale and made an impassioned pitch for donations. <laughs> Somehow, we managed to get enough to survive another year. Due to the success we had in controlling and growing the event in 97, the Bureau of Land Management allowed us to return to the Black Rock in 1998. Wallapai had been beautiful, but the vastness and the majesty of the Black Rock was our home. Black Rock City's population was now 15,000. And Burning Man volunteers created a department called Earth Guardians to help the BLM manage the desert. And continuing the trend began two years earlier. The man was now raised off the playa surface on several courses of hay bales, straw bales, for better visibility. But you could still go up and touch him. Back on the Black Rock for 98, there's more room to, to plan a striking city. Rod Garrett evolved the city design he had started at Wallapai into a full half circle. There is now an art department placing ever more work on the open playa. Bringing Rave Camp back into the fold, the north side of the city is designated louder, while the south side is quieter. In 1998, our ticketing process was turned over to professionals. After the tragedy of 96, I added, you voluntarily assume the risk of serious injury or death by attending. But I think that resulted in making the event even more alluring to people. <laughs> 1998 is the first year that a formal post-burn cleanup report is produced. We organized our first web team in 98, and they created our first real website. Burning Man's following in the tech industry is firmly established after we appeared on the cover of Wired magazine. In fact, some technology companies nearly shut down during Burning Man. Here, the first ever Google Doodle in 98 was noticed to the world that the kids were out playing. Please leave a voicemail. Marvel Comics published X-Force, Volume 75, in March of 98. It proclaimed, Welcome to the exploding colossal man shindig and howl below. Anyway, our exposure outside the playa continued to grow. Burning Man has now expanded to seven days, and you cannot see it all. There are 23,500 participants and 320 theme camps. In 1999, our airport is included on the city plan. Pilot Lisa Schoen would lead the growth of the airport for the next 15 years. In 2009, the airport gained FAA approval and was given the designation 88NV. New Keyhole Plaza, open civic places, were added on the Esplanade. Then the year 2000 brought us the final pieces of the civic puzzle. Now we would add some features that nurtured as well as protected our life within Black Rock City. Part of civic responsibility is the leave no trace ethic, and it came to the fore in 2000. Our post-event cleanup reports were becoming more elaborate, and we analyzed the trash left behind in order to devise new participant cleanup guidelines. First, we named our enemy MOOF, which means matter out of place. On the playa, that means nothing, anything that is not tan dust. These are the guidelines that were suggested by trace analysis. Teaching these five things made a huge difference for our developing playa restoration crew. In 2000, Rod Garrett came up with a bold new design for the center camp tent. It's 34,000 square feet of shade. It was designed as a large diaphragm, a ring pulled into compression by a membrane, which distributes loading from any point. Working with the wind, the slight peak in the center deflects force and tends to hold everything down. This design was modeled in a computer simulation and tested there in 120 mile power winds without failure. This is the Oculus inside. This is the civic heart of the city. And here it's, it's here is its civic soul. 2000 marks the first year of communal introspection at Black Rock City. Three friends, David Best, Jack Hay, and Michael Heflin, planned the Temple of the Mind together. But before the event, Michael died. David and Jack persevered, dedicating the temple to their lost friend. It quickly became clear that Black Rock City needed a place to remember the lost. There's been a temple ever since. 
The hush inside stands in stark contrast to the rest of the city as people cover inside and out with messages, memorials. It's hard to find a dry eye. The temple is burned on the last night of the event in almost complete silence. Now comes one last piece of the puzzle. Remember that short strip of plastic fence in 95? When we moved back to the Black Rock in 98, knowing the value of controlled access, we made that short strip into seven miles of trash fence, which formed a five-sided perimeter around the city. The Black Rock Desert is like an ocean, and I realized that a marine radar system would enable us to keep an eye on that perimeter. In 2000, technology finally sealed the boundary line between Black Rock City and the outside world. Here, we're flicking it on for the first time. The perimeter is now monitored 24 hours a day during the event. It detects vehicles and, in and individuals trying to sneak in without a ticket. By the fourth night of operation, we had caught so many attempted gate crashers, it had paid for itself. <laughs> the radar made a nice complement to the night vision used by our perimeter patrols. Perimeter remains my favorite job on the playa. There's something about being out there on the cool, dark edge of all that creativity which makes you want to protect it even more. And then it was burn night, 2000, the last burn of the 20th century. Closes this inward-looking age of civic and organizational growth. It's the last time we'd raise the man by pulling on a rope together or the last time that we'd be able to reach up and touch his rough skeleton. And as if to memorialize this loss, with a rite of passage, the doomed man wore this thorny crown of fireworks. And as the sun set on the third age, he awaited his ritual demise. This was the age when civic design created civil behavior. We developed a community services department, an art department, communication department, and the Department of Public Works, and our rangers became mediators. Our center camp cafe became our central gathering place, and the temple became our civic soul, and we gained a defensible perimeter. These things allowed us to weather a financial disaster, the arrival of mainstream media, which steadily increased our population. This is the age of outreach, which is defined by an event that's produced and run by what is essentially a production company. We're so good at the event now, we look outward, and the organization gives birth to new endeavors. Also, Burning Man art begins to travel beyond the event. The fourth age begins at the yellow bar. Over the next decade, our population is going to double. But that's OK. The city's dialed in. We can handle more people bringing more fabulous stuff. We want to reach mainstream. They deserve to have their creativity unleashed, too. With things in Black Rock City running so smoothly, the event perks along on autopilot. There are few major changes, and none require much explanation. So I'll whiz past most of that and focus on the outreach that we're beginning to see. Back in 1998, a burner named George Papp returned home to Austin, Texas and started a small local event modeled on Burning Man. It was the first regional burn and was quickly joined by more affiliated burns nationwide. In 2001, to help support them, we fostered the nascent regionals program with the Silver Seed Tour of America. I drove this 30-year-old spaceship-looking RV, which I named Silver Seed after a Neil Young song, on a two-month trip across the US with a mission to visit those new regional groups and spread the Burning Man ethos year-round. The idea is expanding. And Burning Man art begins to get really big, really impressive, and not flammable, meaning it could be repurposed. Here's Michael Christian's flock on Playa. Three months before, it had previewed at San Francisco City Hall for two weeks. We'll see more of this sort of thing in the future. Acquiring a new ticket vendor in 2002, the Burning Man ticket becomes a work of art in its own right. The theme that year is the floating world. Then 2003, beyond belief, admit one human. 
Burning Man is a testing ground for new ideas. The first hexayurt prototype was tested at Burning Man 2003 by its inventor, Vinay Grupta. Made of insulation board and bidirectional filament tape, the hexayurt is a very effective disaster relief shelter, as well as a low-cost insulated shelter option at Burning Man. In 2016, there were more than 2,500 hexayurts at Burning Man. Two thousand four, the vault of heaven. Our regional network was growing. Many more small affiliates had sprung up around the world. By two thousand four, the founders of those events were faced with explaining to a growing number of new people what the heck Burning Man was and why it mattered. How do you, how do we explain who we are and what we do? There are no guidelines. It had grown organically from the seeds of cacophony, and we needed a quicker way to explain it. So Larry distilled the essence of what we'd been doing and what seemed to make it unique into the Ten Principles. It's emergent, not dogma. It's merely an explanation. Today it guides the entire regional's network and gives us a framework for analyzing our philosophy. 2005, the theme was Psyche. The nonprofit relief organization, Burners Without Borders, was created that year when news of Hurricane Katrina reached the event and spread rapidly by word of mouth. A huge relief effort was mounted, which raised $35,000. At the end of the event, scores of volunteers filled donated semi-trucks with food, camping supplies, tools, and equipment. They left the playa and headed for the Gulf Coast. Arriving in New Orleans, arriving in New Orleans burners, working in the face of brutal adversity, applied methods learned in the desert building domes, gifting supplies, fostering community, and activating personal networks to get heavy equipment donated in a way that FEMA never could. Dedicated crews adopted the moniker Burners Without Borders, which truly speaks to the future of Burning Man, taking the event's principles off the playa and out into the world. Hope and fear of the future is the theme in 2006. Population, 40,000. The first matter out of place map is published to visually show the effectiveness of participants' cleanup efforts in their camping areas. The annual unveiling of the MOOP map has become a big deal, with people anxiously awaiting news of how well their camp and their neighbor's camp measured up. Peer pressure is a wonderful thing. These days, the map is much more green. Speaking of green, Green Man was the theme for 2007. We don't pretend to be green per se, we can't. Our mission is elsewhere. And because making and burning art is pretty toxic and, toxic and getting there is resource intensive, this theme rubs some people the wrong way. <laughs> but we wanted to discuss the concept anyway. A tent-like pavilion under the man demonstrated many sustainability projects, and the pavilion was powered by a large solar array. A burner brought this electric car prototype for display at the pavilion. This might look familiar to some of you. Black Rock City's Yellow Bike Program was launched in 2007. A thousand bikes were donated to Burning Man by one individual to be used for our community bike program. We painted them green because Green Man was our theme that year. Of course, outside of Burning Man, people are more familiar with the Yellow Bike Program run by a lot of cities like Amsterdam. So in a moment of Dada inspiration, I had the paint crew stencil this on each green bike. <laughs> this 99-foot-tall wooden all derrick, worshipped by giant steel figures, was a powerful message about the oil economy. In a typical show of Burning Man surrealism, this derrick was incinerated by a thousand-foot column of flame, primed by 900 gallons of jet fuel, fed by 2,000 gallons of liquid propane. It was the largest fire ever produced at Burning Man. concept, if not indeed. 
Remember I mentioned the solar array in the manned pavilion? The solar panels left over from the manned-based pavilion were used to launch BlackRock Solar, the first 501c3 nonprofit solar company in the United States. BlackRock Solar's first installation was at the school in Gerlach. The second installation was at the Pyramid Lake Tribal Reservation. Eventually, they'd installed so many free solar systems along that highway that Nevada's governor declared Route 447 the solar highway. A lot of 2007 art gained traction after the event. The steampunk treehouse was later installed in a craft brewery in Milton, Delaware. <laughs> Big Rig Jig, a beautiful piece by artist Mike Ross, later made an appearance at Coachella and at the 2015 Banksy art installation in the UK. 2008, the man stood on a tower covered with flags from all nations because the theme was the American dream. Population 50,700. And more artists going to live beyond the event. Here's Guardian of Eden by Kate Roddenbush. It's now at the Nevada Museum of Art. It's the first Burning Man art sculpture purchased by a museum for its permanent collection. In 2009, the man stood on a tangled bank, a reference to Charles Darwin's natural variation. Admit one homo sapien to Burning Man 2009. And on the legal front, <laughs> lawyers for burners teamed up with the Nevada chapter of the ACLU to protect the rights of burners and to monitor law enforcement's increasingly questionable behavior on Playa. Here's the all-star team headed for the federal courthouse in Reno. The judge dismissed most of the cases that day for violations of constitutional rights. Looks a little bit like reservoir dogs, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that year, the Gothic ray gun rocket ship landed in San Francisco for a while. Metropolis, life of cities. Art keeps moving out into the world. Here's Marco Cochran's amazing bliss dance in 2010, which is now installed in Las Vegas. Can Burning Man get much bigger? Yes, but not too much bigger. And that fact brings us to the close of this age. So what did this decade look like? Pretty great. The event has hit a stride. We're an odd but efficient event production company. We road trip to reach isolated communities of burners. We pour resources into our worldwide network of locally run regional events. Creativity is at an all-time high with artworks that begin to travel the world. Burners spin off nonprofits for disaster relief and alt energy. We are really looking out at the world now and wanting to help change it. What could go wrong? <laughs> the age of scarcity. In which Burning Man hits the limits to growth in its Nevada home, we renew our emphasis on regional events and we position to meet the future by becoming a nonprofit. In 2011, tickets to Burning Man events sold out for the first time ever. The Black Rock Desert could easily host a million people. But getting there and back is the bottleneck. Highway 447 is only one lane in each direction. It's a physical capacity limit that can't be denied. That's one of the reasons that the BLM has always stipulated a 70,000-person population cap in our permit to rent the Burning Man site. In 2011, we reached that cap. It was a rite of passage for the entire organization. Human psychology is strange. The moment something becomes scarce, hoarding begins. Even if you only needed one ticket, you'd buy two just in case. Even if you thought Burning Man sounded stupid, suddenly you had to go. <laughs> now everyone wants in. It's a quest for the golden ticket. 70,000 possible people, but twice that many requesting access. What to do? In an attempt to be as fair as possible, to give old timers and newcomers, the rich and the poor, all the same chance to give a ticket, we try to ticket sale by lottery. Let an impartial computer decide who goes to Burning Man. Who the fuck do you think you are playing God 
over who goes to Burning Man and who does not. What kind of a moral position is that to be in? It's almost like we don't want to listen to what they're saying. But when the dust settled after the lottery, many burners crucial to our infrastructure and theme camps were left without tickets. They were upset. It turns out that nobody really wanted a fair system, they just wanted a ticket. <laughs> Many experienced something like the intimate betrayal you'd feel if your own mother rejected you. It nearly tore the community apart. We scrambled to resolve the problem, creating a program to direct tickets to department volunteers, key people creating theme camps, art installations, and mutant vehicles. That curated ticket problems program still exists and is still being refined. About 35% of our tickets are now distributed that way in a radical inclusion paradox that adjusts the ratio of experience versus new participants improving enculturation. There's one other problem with scarcity. No matter how devoted you are to the Burning Man principle of decommodification, scarcity raises the cost of access. It's supply and demand. Scarcity favors those who can pay ticket scalpers more for access. It disfavors the artists and creatives who invented the culture. Paying whatever it takes to get a ticket might destroy the fabric of what you're seeking in the first place. <laughs> Wealthy people, we love them too. Radical inclusion, right? They have as much need to explore their creativity as anyone else. But the arrival of wealthy newbies creates, requires yet more enculturation. Many of the wealthy new arrivals are used to buying all-inclusive vacation packages. They figured that's how you do Burning Man too. This gave rise to the plug-and-play camps, which we are now working to mitigate. Exclusive isolated camps where hired staff serve every whim are the antithesis of why we go to the desert. There's no personal challenge in being pampered, no transformative experience. To their credit, many plug-and-play campers immediately get that when they first arrive and they return another year to throw themselves into the full experience. Education will remain our biggest challenge moving into the future, but I think we can win this battle too. Our secret weapon of the future will be our regional network, which has now more than 80 regions in 34 countries doing events in places as diverse as Spain, South Africa, China, Korea, Australia, and Argentina. In fact, the fastest growing regions seem to be in places that have struggled with culture clash for generations. Here is the third annual Midburn in Israel. Five days, 8,264 participants, 106 art installations, 130 theme camps. Palestinians and Israelis camping together. Who would have thought? And Africa Burn, near Cape Town, South Africa, now in its eighth year with 12,000 participants. The latest regional Burning Man culture is now taking root in Russia. And back in Nevada, Burning Man's recent purchase of our 1997 location, Fly Ranch, was made possible with donations from dedicated community members. Now we have a physical pole star that our culture can revolve around it all year and into the future. To guide that future, to, to guide that future we have transformed into a nonprofit. We founders, Crimson Rose, Will Roger, Harley Dubois, Marion Goodell, myself, and Larry Harvey will someday have to exit on that silver spaceship. We're passing the seed to the next generation. I believe the next generation will make us proud. Thank you. Uh, I would like to point out that the Nevada Museum of Art has just mounted an incredible Burning Man history exhibit called City of Dust, and it runs for six months up until January 7th. Be sure and ca catch it. It's incredible. Thank you so much. Reno. Reno, Nevada. Yes. It's not quite as far as Burning Man, but, you know.
<laughs> it's good. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, there's parts of this talk that I literally get chills in. I mean, starting um, you know with that the moment in '96, which is kind of the first morning I woke up at Burning Man was that morning mm -hmm. um, where I was the closest tent to the tent that got hit. Yeah. Um, and um, and then, but to the end where you see that picture, and when I saw that picture of uh, of Midburn at Israel, yeah. it's just like sparks. Mm -hmm. Like the 1996 moment all over again, you realize um, how things are going to evolve in the future. So um, thank you so much for that. And I'm also just curious as to um, just a bit of your personal trajectory as the Burning Man historian. Have you, at what point did you kind of feel as though you were taking on this role or did it just <laughs> come on you? Or? I began to take it over gradually uh, as uh, we put together. I want to thank my wife, Dusty, here. She has spent many, many weeks helping assemble this talk and a couple of others that I do, uh, doing research, and uh, it's really great. I want to thank her. Awesome. But uh, now I'm doing more and more talks. Uh, my role really is uh, as a historian. Uh, I have collected, saved pretty much everything since the beginning. So uh, I've had this huge historical archive stored in a uh, wooden attic in San Francisco. You know, fires and such. So I'm really relieved to have it in the Nevada Museum of Art in Reno. that are taking really wonderful care, and they've mounted this incredible exhibit. And in 2018, the Burning Man exhibit is going to the Smithsonian. Wow. Yes, indeed. And um, yeah, it just so happened that we were at, when we were at the Nevada Museum of Art was when that collection was uh, starting to come in. Yeah. So uh, Bill Fox, who also spoke in the series, mm -hmm. um, is helping with that, I know. Um, I want to open it up to other questions. Um, I know that we'll have many, and as I said, we'll have a, a short um, time. But please do raise your hand and oh, raise your mic, because uh, Michael will have already given it to you. Eddie. <laughs> yes. Um, fascinating. I, so with the acquisition of Fly Ranch recently, does that portend the beginning of the sixth age of Burning Man? And if so, what will that look like? Um, maybe so. We're really looking at Fly Ranch with what we can do with it. Uh, we want to use it to uh, promote and encourage the culture of Burning Man. And that encompasses an incredible range of possibilities. Uh, right now we have a team on site doing a, an assessment that's going to take a long time. We are cataloging every plant species, every animal, and uh, the geology, the hydrology, and doing a very prolonged study of what is there. Uh, Fly Ranch is interesting. It uh, was a cattle ranch for years. Uh, even the Fly Geyser is a man-made feature, so there's nothing really natural about that anymore. But we want to see what we can do with it. It's an incredibly beautiful place and has a tremendous amount of water on it. So we are researching that right now. Thank you. Uh, I've got a quick question, but do raise your hands and I'll get you the mic for the next one. Great. Um, so can you say something about how the relationship with Reno is today? Because obviously the museum show is going up there, but how has that changed and how is, yeah, what's the relationship between Burning Man and, and the city of it's, Reno? It's these funny, days? well, like even in San Francisco, you only spoke of Burning Man in the closet. You didn't tell anybody you actually went. And that was certainly the case in Reno. Uh, the media had blown all these crazy stories about, and so it was something that uh, you didn't really talk about. It was seen as something uh, bad. And over time, as we grew and the art expanded and people actually came out to see what was happening at Burning Man, uh, we've had a tremendous influence on what, Bernie, what Reno is to the point now we are such a part of Reno. Uh, there's more works of Burning Man art in Reno than any other place in the country. Uh, the, the, it's encouraged a renaissance of not only uh, art, but even maker culture. And I think that Burning Man is going to influence even more than that as we start to move into the realms of, of technology and experimentation at Burning Man. And it's, Reno's an exciting place to be right now. Thank you, over at the bar. 
So thank you. There was a really great narrative arc, um, and and un, you know unveiling the way in which the ethos and the, and the operating principles of a structure like this works. I'm. I just wanted to notice that we're in a very interesting era in terms of our civic society. And I'm curious what you think, what, what would you export from these, this ethos of self-organization, civic responsibility, et cetera, to other domains of existing civic sort of you know, experiences where much needed reorganization you know, is, is desired? Mm -hmm. What uh, yes, we way? are in an interesting uh, situation in our world and our culture today. Uh, I really think that Burning Man has a lot to teach the world in general. Uh, what is happening is, uh, particularly in this country, we're shifting away from a consumer society and into an experience-based society. And there's no moral compass in that area yet. And Burning Man is teaching people uh, ways to have a community together where everyone gets along and shared resources. And I think Burning Man can teach the world a lot. It's a very interesting year for the Moscow Regional Burn to have its first year. Yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm also curious, I mean, it, the, the number of years that this was the last year of Burning Man because of the, you know, the crisis, a death, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the ticketing crisis, uh, money crises. Um, the, what do you think was the special sauce within the organization that pushed through? I mean, there's, any number of these things would have, would have stopped another type of event. And was it, this, was it a particular mix of people or was it some other interaction between First them? of all, Burning Man is such a powerful idea that it has its own momentum. And those of us who were there in the early days, we had the Burning Man experience, and the experience gave us what we needed to prevail. Thank you. Right here. Front. So it sounds like um, World's Fair. It, it sounds like you could be doing, uh, instead of an industrial World's Fair, you could be doing a, a peaceful transformation World's Fair, and, and then you have all the spin-offs. It's sort of like the Maker Fair and all the Maker mm -hmm. Fairs around the world. You're doing that too. Um, and that could be cooperative. That could be a matter of using it as a forum to show what you can do to survive sustainably, what you can do to work together and cooperate. I mean, just all that stuff becomes a theme that repeats itself and gets expanded and exported. And, made, and I think that a lot of young kids would really be fascinated with that if they got to have the ideas and the visions and some things to play with. Um, That's a great all. idea, and I'm looking forward to you come out, coming out and getting that started. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Indeed, the early principle of if you have the idea, now it's your job to d attempt it poorly, right? Yeah, yes. <laughs> I think my favorite definition of Burning Man from early on was uh, great ideas executed poorly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Exactly. Uh, do we have another question in the audience? Uh, I'll keep this simple. So, I mean, um, I, have, I have, you know, friends that come and ask me, so how is Burning Man? Like, what, what is Burning Man? And it's always a struggle to, to explain because it's, it's kind of something that goes beyond uh, simple explanation. You kind of have to tell stories and, and really go into it. Um, and I, I'm really curious. They eventually hate you for <laughs> yeah. that question. It's like nine, <laughs> nine hours later, they're like, oh, man, wow. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm really curious, like, you know, ha have you guys started formulating a way to really try to distill like, the embodiment of it beyond the, the ten tenets and everything? Uh, <laughs> distill the embodiment. First of all, of course, you can't really describe Burning Man unless you've, you have to experience it to know what it is. And uh, I, I've been thinking a lot about what is it exactly that changes people, people's lives. And I think that's going to be the next talk. Nice. Um, I'm also curious, um, as 
a nonprofit administrator um, coming up on the same age of an organization as you, there was, um, you know, there was a very interesting transition that I think you're getting close to as well as long now. Um, and then there was also this transition that happened many years ago from a volunteer organization to a paid organization, mm -hmm. which I can only imagine, I mean, there's so much kind of volunteer work that went in ahead of time to create this thing, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it shifts, and then there's profession, you know, it's like now it's a few people's profession, but it still needs, you know, massive amounts of volunteer labor. Mm -hmm. And I, yes. I'm wondering how that discussion went, and then, um, how, what are the thoughts uh, in the going forward part that you mentioned towards the end? Yeah, the, uh, the growth, the evolution of Burning Man has been a zigzagged path. And it, it's been a learning curve. And uh, there were some very difficult times, uh, certainly in the early days when we suddenly found ourselves spending months working on it and hauling stuff out to the desert. And we say, Josh, I can't make the rent this month. And we, we first realized we had to start paying ourselves and uh, work, figuring out a financial system that would begin to carry us through. Uh, we began as an LLC, which was technically for-profit, but we, of course, were not for-profit even then because we believed in the vision of what we were doing. And uh, eventually we realized uh, we're starting to get older and grayer and we need some mechanism for this to carry beyond our lifetime. And so we explored uh, nonprofit models and we found a, a very brilliant uh, attorney here locally, Brooke Oliver, who helped us, shepherd us through that process. So uh, yes, it's a series of steps that you go through. Thank you. Question there. Thank you uh, so much for giving this talk. Um, my question is around communication. Um, and going into the future, it seems like Burning Man is going to face some serious scaling issues, but which you've already begun to address, especially to the, the regional groups. When you started Burning Man, the way that you communicated with your group, uh, the Cacophony Society, was very different than the way that people communicate today. And um, sort of there's a surplus of communication tools and also information. Um, how do you view this communication challenge in light of the event? And uh, what kind of strategies or <laughs> solutions do you see on the horizon in terms of the communication challenge? Well, you, you almost need to identify what you mean by those communication challenges. Uh, I have been keenly interested in communication. The, the first thing I learned uh, in, uh, when I started the Black Rock Rangers is we were on this vast place and we got radios. So we communicate way out there. So the rangers had radios, and they could communicate with each other and go to one place or the other. And we learned the terrain and where things were at. And that was the first big step in communication. And uh, now we're up to several thousand radios and hundreds of frequencies to operate the event. And that's just radio communications. But uh, there was an interesting point, I, I think it was about 1998, where I was out on the playa, and I was working with the rangers. We were doing all this stuff, and there's fire and explosion. And the sheriff was out there standing by, beside me, and he sees nothing but chaos. And he was freaked out. But I knew what every fire was. I had rangers at every place. I knew what was going on on the whole landscape. So communications is very important. Uh, then, as the internet grew, uh, the Cacophony Society originally started, you mail something out, and a month later, you'd, you'd, you, know, you would see who actually showed up at your event. It was, it's like a flash mob in slow motion. <laughs> uh, but there was a point at which the internet really uh, expanded, and suddenly, all these images from Burning Man flooded millions of images over the next few years, and all of a sudden, people began to take notice. And people could see, oh, this incredible art. There's amazing things going out here. That was the next step in communication. And then I remember uh, uh, not very long ago when I picked up my cell phone, my God, there's a cell signal out here. And uh, a lot of people are kind of ambivalent about the idea because it, it kind of takes away from be here now. And at the same time, it adds another layer on top of things. Uh, 
one of the first flash mob cacophony events that happened on the playa was because we had phones and we used them to uh, tweet about an event that's happening at midnight. We're going to sneak in and take over this artwork. And so at midnight, I show up there because I had heard about it, and I crawl into this place. And inside is a complete bar, casino with a nightclub act, and it was strictly guerrilla. And this is the kind of pop-up thing that can happen. Uh, the, what's really interesting, and will be interesting in the future, is the uh, augmented technology. Uh, I could foresee a time when you could be walking on the playa and you'd probably have your sunglasses or something and there would be somebody else there, but they're not really there. They're sitting at a computer room somewhere in Australia and they've got everything and you can have a conversation with them. That's what the future could be. Uh, we can't go back to those crazy wild days where we ran around like naked savages but it was glorious. <laughs> but you remind me of uh, an early experience that I had. I, used, I did a camp called Antarctica, which was a refrigerated semi-trailer. So we did a dance party during the day. Um, and uh, um, we'd run it at 40 degrees. And at one point, uh, we worked with John Gilmore and Brewster Kale to bring a tachyon dish. I think it was 98 or 99, we brought mm -hmm. a real internet connection. I don't know if it was the first one or not, but it was certainly the first one I knew of. And, um, and we were doing a live video chat in that Antarctica mm -hmm. to McMurdo Station. Um, <laughs> and I sat this woman down, who's topless, in front of the screen, and she's like, She's like, who am I talking to? I was like, it's, it's another Antarctica, the other Antarctica. So she's talking and it, like, <laughs> eventually she realizes it wasn't just a camp across the way. <laughs> it was actually Antarctica. It just freaked her out. Um, and the guys who were wintering over in McMurdo were pretty happy too. Um, <laughs> But that, that kind of uh, just amazing connection, um, it was both a good and a bad thing. And then a bunch of people in our camp got emailed of all kinds of tragedies in the real world. And I realized I never wanted a connection at Burning Man again. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm also curious with this communication. There's and 100 the, million stories in the Black Rock Desert, and that's one of them. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I get to tell my playa story since I have the mic. Um, the... The enculturation and the process that the, um, that the Black Rock Rangers have gone through, what, what level of training do they get now, and how has that kind of evolved? Uh, I wrote the first Black Rock Ranger manual in 95, I think. Uh, the, the Rangers, first of all, they have to have gone to Burning Man for a couple of years to know what it's about. That's the first thing. Uh, then they go through a training program uh, which is now happening in many places around the country uh, where the, they're, they're taught all about the, the rangers and uh, how to use techniques and strategies for uh, mediation with people. And uh, once they arrive on site, after they've had that training, they go through what's known as a mentorship test. And they go out as rangers in the city with two season mentors and it's like a test and you pass or you fail and uh, anyone who wants to be a cop fails automatically so we go through a testing process to choose our rangers that's very cool question on the stairs um, you uh, you mentioned the turnkey camps and how you're doing something to the organization's mm -hmm. doing something to mitigate those camps now. I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you could speak more to exactly what you're doing there and kind of how you steer a ship that's mm -hmm. so large, looking at uh, the community moving into the future. Uh, one way, first of all, we're encouraged them to be interactive. So we're only given placement to camps if they can show or demonstrate or have a plan where they're going to interact on their, their boundary, their placement. So uh, we're, they also have to have a plan for cleanup, for protecting the environment, and uh, usually they have to have a, a person designated as a liaison to work with us and work with our team. So we're going through a process where we're finding solutions to that issue. Thank you. So 
Burning Man was described as an arts festival at times, and obviously you guys have enabled lots of, of art, but it's a lot more than that as well. But um, I, I wonder what your thoughts are on, there are a lot of organizations that have wide impacts around the world. Um, I don't know if anyone that does has art at its center in the way that Burning mm -hmm. Man does, and I, I wonder about your thoughts of having art in sort of the the engine and the center of that, how that differs from, uh, and, and the way that that's led to the type of outreach and the type of impact that, that Burning Man has had. Uh, Burning Man has already had a tremendous impact on the art world. Uh, first, the idea that anyone can do art. And the other idea that art doesn't have to be locked in some stuffy gallery. It can be out in the open. And art can be interacted with and that's so important. So we've, we've have already changed the face of art. Question in the front? And I don't think we've had a single woman ask a question, so I'm gonna challenge, do we have one? Well, we did, oh sorry, off, our, our own staff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> we've had one woman out of all the questions, so I would challenge more female questions. Hi, Stuart Brand. Um, I'm curious how rules get arrived at, like the rule of no dogs, or <clears throat> the managing of people taking photographs of naked burners and then broadcasting them to the world, and that got finessed. How do those, you might explain how that got finessed, but how do those rule decisions get arrived at? Well, we, first of all, it, it comes up as a problem. And uh, somebody, Maybe not everybody, but an individual or a camp or a group of people or some staff member has an issue with something. And we take a look at that. Who's we? We, uh, first off, it starts out in the department, the area that they're in, and then it gets filtered up to other uh, sub-departments, and we have, it's, it, Burning Man has become very bureaucratic now. It's, it's, it's fine, but it's still a much broader uh, institution than you would imagine. And uh, the leaders, managers, sit down and go through long discussion uh, sessions and try to come up with uh, an agreement of what exactly is the issue and how we can tackle it to solve the problem. So we've created rules, by and large, but still, Burning Man is the freest, most rule-free place that exists. Uh, there's so many rules that have evolved or come about in our society. Uh, a lot of them are just moral rules because somebody believes some way and you shouldn't do that. And, uh, in the early days, we, we ran up against the moral code of many of the local surrounding populations. And uh, even though we were across the mountain and four hours away, they didn't want us doing this or that because they didn't do it in their town. So uh, I think really that uh, Black Rock City is the first really global community that exists on the planet. Not just the people who come there from all over the globe, but our values uh, that we have here that are shared is truly global. We, uh, Long Now staff visited uh, the site right after Bur the Fly Ranch was mm -hmm. purchased and uh, for around the time of early burn, just a few weeks, several weeks before the burn last year. And there was probably 5,000 people on the playa at that time, which mm -hmm. blew me away that the level of, of organization that was happening and the, you know, the population of the city was already, mm -hmm. you know, many percentage points in mm -hmm. and it was weeks before and all they were doing was building art and infrastructure, which I think uh, people rarely appreciate the, the scale that's, that's happening long before the gates open. Um, I wonder if you'd say anything about that evolution. Yeah, uh, ramping up to build a city is really an interesting process, especially with Burning Man. Um, 
having different areas of responsibility that people are involved with, uh, we've learned it's very important to have volunteers and staff members uh, have a very strong vested interest in their area of what they're doing and take pride in it. Uh, the Rangers and DPW have a tremendous esprit de corps. And what you want to do is instill that. And it's, it's more value than getting paid. So what we've done is instilled a sense of, of pride and ownership in what people are involved with. And then we have a system where it organically grows, where it's not directed per se, but they're given the outline of what needs to be done. And they're able to grow their staff in an organic manner very rapidly. And it's, it's amazing building a city for 70,000 people within a couple of weeks. A couple more questions up front. Following up on what Stuart asked, and you just said about scaling. Have other organizations or individuals approached you to say, based on what you've learned, how can we have a more connective culture? How can we scale something in a positive way? I'm just curious if others have approached you. So I hear two questions, one about scaling and one about connecting. Uh, Burning Man is, is a participant-created content. And there are some organizations that are doing very well with that, tech companies. Um, communication is another aspect of that. And uh, it's an area that we need to explore more and more, communication of our culture and how do you spread it and expand it. And that's an area we're looking into. How to get my insights and make that happen? Well, <laughs> sounds like we need to do some research here. <laughs> Question at the bar. Yeah. Uh, eventually, some academicians are going to jump in on this and milk it for 100 doctoral dissertations <laughs> on the dynamics of the evolution of this problem. There's at least been a few. I There's believe. already <laughs> been many, many dissertations, yes. and they're on the internet, and some of them are really interesting. So you should definitely look those up. Uh, there's there's uh, dissertations about organization, uh, dissertations about technology at Burning Man. Uh, there's there's a lot out there. Many cities we, send, yeah. send their planners to Burning Man. I mean, that's been oh, going yes, on for a long yes, time now. Right. Yeah. Uh, there's a group called Burning Nerds, <laughs> which actually are tuned into all of that. Sorry, was there more questions? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's his, his after everything. But uh, as I would say in the crew, in ghost kakulu. <laughs> Last question. Last Melissa, question. Melissa. Uh, having gone 29 times, I'm curious what was the last thing um, that most recently delighted you, surprisingly delighted you on the playa, personally? Wow. You know, I'm always, there's always something new and delightful, and everybody finds something. Uh, what delighted me? I don't know. You know, I'm a, I'm a jaded burner. <laughs> yeah. It takes a lot. I have seen things you wouldn't believe. <laughs> and I believe in things you can't see. And I know things. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>